Hi, and welcome back to uh, this breakout session. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Pippa Corey today. So Pippa Corey qualified in medicine at Oxford University, having previously undertaken a PhD in anti-cancer drug development. She was appointed as consultant medical oncologist at Adam Brooks Hospital, Cambridge in 1997, and is an associate lecturer in the University of Cambridge. She is the NIHR's Clinical Research Network National Specialty Lead for Late Phase and International Cancer Trials and Cancer Specialty Lead for the NIHR Eastern Clinical Research Network. Pippa is actively involved in clinical and translational research development. She is chief investigator of several academic and commercial sponsored NIHR portfolio uh, melanoma and pancreatic cl cancer clinical trials. She is currently chairs. Uh, she currently chairs the NCRI Pancreatic Cancer Workstream and has published over 120 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Pippa Corey. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Pippa Corey. I think your microphone is muted currently. I'm so sorry. Is that better? That's better, yes, thank you. Um, so I'm just trying to share my slides. Okay, can you see those? Yes, we can see those slides. Perfect, great. Okay, so yeah, so thank you for that introduction. And um, yeah, so I've been in the business of, of writing papers probably for 30 odd years. I'm showing my age, I'm afraid. Um, but um, I hope that I'll be able to impart a few tips to, um, to the likes of yourselves who are really sort of hopefully starting out on, on this journey. Um, so, oh, how do I move my slides? Okay. So what I've done is I've structured this talk um, in four sections. Firstly, about preparing to publish. Um, about writing a manuscript itself, um, some general writing tips, and then the inevitable dealing with rejection. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll just go straight into this. And firstly, really just to say that, that writing is very different to the clinical work that, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it is a very different mindset and you have to get into that mindset to really um, make it work. And I think the, the problem that a lot of us have is, is justifying, particularly in the early stages, is, is why on earth do I want to publish? It's not what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to be a doctor, uh, but what's this got to do with me? And there are lots of disincentives as well. Um, and I think the biggest one is, is about time constraints. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit more depth. I think one of the other problems is that now you guys tend to rotate quite quickly through specialties. So I think it is quite difficult to um, keep hold of an interest as you rotate through areas. Um, nobody teaches you, I think, in medical school about technical and writing skills. It's something that you do need to evolve um, for yourself. And the question I guess is also what difference will it make? Well, I think there are a lot of incentives as well to writing. There are really good technical and writing skills that you do need to develop, even if you're not going to be an academic. You're likely to be writing reports, you're likely to be writing um, SOPs, um, just simple letter writing. You need to be able to, to, to do this well. Um, and um, equally, professionally, uh, whatever job you, you end up going for, you do need to try and develop that CV to make yourself look um, a credible um, individual for a, a consultant job in due course. Um, and you know, things like your, your publications will separate you out from your colleagues when you go for, for jobs. Um, it's really good in terms of your personal development. Um, medicine is all about an inquiring mind, um, evolving your, your scientific interests, your clinical interests. Um, you need to be able to read papers and, and, and also write them. Um, and clearly communicating um, both in writing and um, in, in, in speech is, is part and parcel of what we do every day. Um, and it is actually enormously satisfying. So I really do think it's, 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 a, it's a good skill for all of us. But the, the time to write is probably the biggest challenge that a lot of us face. Um, and so you do need to be able to schedule quality time. 
you need to find uninterrupted time away from, from work, from children, from other interruptions. And you really do need to try and find um, a, a block of clear time. Um, and that could be an hour, but ideally half a day, a morning, an afternoon, something like that, where you can really get stuck into a project. Try not to write in isolation. Um, so ideally you need somebody more senior than yourself who will oversee, particularly in the early days of writing, a senior colleague or a mentor um, who might be you know, guiding that project. But also it's quite good to have what I've described as a writing buddy. So somebody working alongside you who could be a fellow trainee or a medical student. So you're, you're juggling the writing together. So there's a whole load of, of problems that, that you might sort of start thinking about as you, as you um, set out on your writing project. And there's time, there's also too much time. So sometimes people don't put in any deadlines for, for, for where you want to go. And so there is no pressure to what you're trying to achieve. Um, the project might be too hard or too scary. You might be uh, needing encouragement. You need self-discipline. The task might feel too big. You may just feel you cannot write. Or you may not have a topic that really has engaged you to write about. So here just sort of a few tips as to the things that you can do to overcome those obstacles to writing. So keep a good di a diary and a calendar of, um, of when you're going to write and those clear uninterrupted periods of time. Uh, book time with your personal editor or your writing buddy um, and, so, and set those deadlines, what you want to achieve within the time frame of this project. Work with your colleagues. Um, talk to your colleagues, particularly when you're in areas that you're, you're, you're still quite um, junior in. For example, statistics, a lot of us struggle with. Talk to your statistician. Don't be afraid to admit that you don't understand some of the issues that, that you may be grappling with and accept that you need other people's expertise. But meet with your colleagues regularly and review the progress regularly. Set those deadlines um, and don't start with something too big. So something nice and small, a case report, a case series is a good place to start. If you struggle with writing, dictate your ideas and then you can reshape them. Um, but keep an ideas file. Um, so a number of us sort of come across something, oh, that's a good idea. And then you kind of forget about it. Well, keep these things, uh, just make a note and then in due, due course, you can come back to it. Um, it's much, much easier to write about something that you really are passionate about um, than, than something that really is, is, is just being given to you by somebody else. So you've thought of something that you want to publish. Why do you want to publish it? What you need to think about, is it new? Is it interesting? Is it related directly to a hot topic? So for example, recently with the, the COVID pandemic, there's been a massive surge of publications in this area that clearly didn't exist um, at the beginning of the year. But already that, that area is getting a little bit, um, it was much tougher now actually to publish in than, than it was at, at, um, back in March. But have you found a solution to a problem, a, a simple problem, a difficult problem? That might depend um, on what kind of a journal uh, might take what you've found. So if the answer to any of these is yes, then you've got something worth writing about. So second issue, writing that manuscript. You do need what I've described as a battle plan. So compared with this young lady here, who's got all the enthusiasm that suddenly disappears very quickly, you really need to prepare your writing uh, plan in order to actually succeed in getting to the end of, of this mammoth journey. So take time to organize your thoughts, think carefully and prepare the framework for your manuscript. What is it that you want to say? What is the key message that you want to get over? Uh, why do you care about this? Because that might reflect whether other people are going to care about it too. Who's the intended audience? And what format and type of journal will you be submitting to? And we'll talk a bit more about journals in a minute. Why is this audience going to be interested? 
And also think about who you're going to be writing this with. We mentioned earlier about the personal editor and a writing buddy, but who else is contributing or contributed to the work that needs to be uh, and that needs to be involved in the, the writing up of the project? So selecting a journal is a big issue. Um, and obviously here we've got a, a little picture of some very high profile journals, but we don't necessarily always need to, to aim high um, or that high. Um, and it, it's sometimes better to, to start more modestly and build up to some of these higher impact journals in due course. But think about who is your target audience and determine what journals they read. So, which journal might serve the purpose for publishing your article? Is your study a good fit for that journal? And if you don't know that, you need to actually pick up the journal um, or read it online and go and have a look and see what papers are actually being published routinely in that journal. Um, do take advice from your senior editor or your mentor, um, who obviously will have a wealth of experience and may well um, know a lot about what it's like to get into um, these various journals. We're going to talk about impact factor. Um, think about the journal's reputation in the field um, that you're working in and end up with generating a list of two to four suitable journals and prioritize them um, so that if you um, unfortunately get rejected by your, your first choice, you have um, a second and a third to fall back on um, in due course. So we hear a lot about impact factors um, and, and they are useful, but they're not the only consideration when judging quality of your manuscript. So very high quality manuscripts can be published in lesser impact factor journals. Not all journals are tracked in the journal citation report database. Um, so just remember that and look a bit more widely and particularly some of the newer journals um, may not yet actually have um, a citation. Um, so um, just again, look around and see what actually will suit uh, your study rather than simply going for high impact factors. So I've just summarized here some of the um, main sort of onco yeah, oncology journals that um, you might be thinking about um, in terms of their impact factor. You see here that only about 2% of um, papers get published in impact factor journals of 10 and above. So that's a really, really high threshold to aim for. Um, if you've got really something amazingly, uh, you know, unique and groundbreaking, absolutely fine. So um, some fabulous registration, multi-center clinical trials, changing uh, clinical practice will head for the New England Journal. But a lot of where uh, you're likely to start and, and, and are completely credible is going for this middle group. Um, of impact factors of, of three and above. And here you can see um, good journals like British Journal of Cancer, Clinical Oncology, ESMO Open, all uh, around about that three to five impact factor um, level. And they're absolutely fine. Also just think about some of the disease specific journals. If you've got something that's specifically in breast cancer or melanoma or gut, then obviously you can head towards um, tumor specific journals. So do look around, take your time and don't simply go for the very high impact factors where the chances of, of acceptance are really, really low. Make sure that you read the journal instructions to the authors. So every journal has its own idiosyncrasies and you do need to make sure um, that you're not setting yourself up to fail from the beginning. Um, so, for example, um, there are um, some journals that will very clearly state in uh, upfront they will not take case reports or case series. So, you know, for heaven's sake, don't go in their in their direction. Um, think about the the size of the the manuscripts that are published. Um, sometimes you may want to write beyond what um, their maximum word count is. So these kind of things uh, you really do need to, to read and take time to make sure that you have the right fit for your paper. So when you start to construct the manuscript itself, and there's a little acronym, IMRAD, uh, which is really the basis of, of most uh, manuscript formats. 
And it's very straightforward um, and you'll probably all be very familiar with it. Um, and it comes in one way, shape or form, but it's basically an introduction. What did you or others do and why did you do it? Methods, how did you do it? The results, what did you find? And the discussion, what does it mean? I've just put back up there in the results section, some people actually find that they really quite like to start with the results and the tables and then build from there. Because actually, when you think about it, that's the nubbins of your study. It may help you to shape your key message and then you can build your introduction, your methods and your discussion around that results section. Make sure you don't oversell your story. Always try and, uh, and um, be modest, be straight. Don't, um, don't yeah, extend beyond what you've really got um, to, to, to say. So in the introduction, a brief introduction is needed. Don't expect to cover the whole of the evidence base um, of a particular topic. You really just want to aim for the, um, the, the, the key manuscripts that um, summarize the, um, the background of the topic that you're going to be um, discussing. You want to say what is known so far? Um, what are the unknown aspects relevant to your topic? Uh, what are the primary and secondary questions um, that will be addressed in your study? And try and keep it to a relatively modest amount of the total word count of your manuscript. In the materials and methods, uh, describe what was done in the past tense. You want to set out the study design. Is this a prospective study, a retrospective cohort, a case study, and so on? What was the setting? Is this in a hospital setting? Um, is it a community project? Is it a laboratory project? And so on. You always need to think about an ethics statement and with patients, the element of informed consent. If it's a clinical trial, um, you'll probably be very familiar that most protocols these days have you know, pages worth of key entry criteria. Um, pick out the key ones that are relevant um, to the population of study. Um, don't try and list everything because your word count will just disappear very quickly. Again, with any kind of laboratory work, summarize the methods as succinctly as you can. And remember um, that you can reference other published methods, other trial protocols and so on um, to save on your word count. If there's lots of stuff that you think is important, um, but you don't necessarily have the, the space to put in your main paper, then consider placing it in supplementary material um, that can be published online alongside the main manuscript. Statistics, really important to include in your methods section. Um, you need to say how and when your data was collected. Is there a sample size calculation? Um, and how was the data analyzed? If you haven't uh, already done so, involve a statistician where you can. Um, it always looks much better to be able to demonstrate that you've got statistical advice um, preferably as a co-author, certainly acknowledged um, that they have um, reviewed and agree with your analyses. Data presentation. Check the maximum tables and figures allowed. Most public, uh, journals will limit the number of tables and figures um, and don't go beyond what you're um, told is the maximum. Tables can be very helpful, but you need to make sure they're le legible, sorry, intelligible and useful. Um, and sometimes those tables can get very big and unwieldy. So have a think about whether any of that data can be better represented in a figure, which is more eye catching and simple. Figures need to be simple and clear. Um, also consider what happens when they become black and white. So online, obviously everything can be color and look really snazzy, but most journals um, when they uh, print in hard copy will print black and white. Um, other, or they will charge a very high rate for color printing. Um, so just think about what your figures are gonna look like in black and white. You can be creative. So in limited figures, um, you can, um, break down those figures into, for example, A, B, and C, where the data is linked. 
And again, you can put additional data that you think is really interesting, but isn't necessarily the priority for the paper into a supplement, supplementary section that can be published online. So just to share a few sort of examples of, of pitfalls of, of figures that, um, uh, and these are sort of my examples, we were generating some data from the SAC database looking at the introduction of immune checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment of melanoma patients. And our first go at a figure of the breakdown of the different checkpoint inhibitors on an annual basis uh, was generated in this rather sort of blue shaded um, diagram. Um, and although it was okay, um, when you turn that into black and white, it really lost its, um, it, there's the separate sections. So ultimately we actually did a completely different color change so that it was much clearer as to uh, what the different drugs and, um, and blocks looked like. Another example here of um, where um, I think color is, it, it was, was not really helpful. This was in the uh, online version of a, of a melanoma paper where you can see a whole series of, of survival curves with the different uh, BRAF um, MEK inhibitors and checkpoint inhibitors. Which is, you can just about make out um, in color, uh, but when that was turned into black and white, it was a completely meaningless figure actually. And here's another example, uh, one of our own um, from the siege trial, where actually this is an example where we did break down a single figure. So figure one became A, B, C, and D, because we were able to link the progression free and overall survival um, in this population uh, with intent to treat and evaluable patients. And in fact, here we paid for online um, access, which actually enabled us to have color printing both um, online and in the hard copy. So hopefully our figures uh, were, were intelligible um, in the, um, the actual uh, hard copy volume. So the discussion section, start with the main findings and link back to the introduction and key issues on this topic. And there is an hourglass that I'll show you on the next slide, which I think is important to try and make sure that you do link the introduction, the discussion. And it's really helpful because I think people can get very lost in the discussion, can start waffling and going off in completely different tangents. But I think it's really important to try and focus that discussion on the topics that you started uh, to unpack in the introduction. Make some room for strengths and weaknesses. It's always good to reflect on, on the, the, the positives and the negatives of the way that you've undertaken your particular study. And what are the implications for future research? And quite often a summary statement uh, may be helpful or even required at the end. So this is the hourglass that I uh, was referring to in terms of the reflection of the introductory section and the final discussion. So in that introduction, you remember we talked about discussing the background, the known facts, the areas of uncertainty and the aims. And then in the discussion, you just reflect that back. What were your main results? How does that compare with the literature out there? What are the strengths and the limitations of your work and what are the implications for the future? So no, you're not done. There's still a lot more yet to come before you can actually submit this uh, manuscript, which is coming along nicely. The title. What fun people can have with a title. This gives the first impression of the manuscript. So think about it carefully. Try and identify some keywords because people will search. So search engines will look for keywords. Um, and um, so you need to get them right. Um, you need something around the specialty that the article belongs to. You need something about the disease or condition um, that you're referring to. And you need something about the particular test or intervention. And you want to convey that information um, succinctly. Don't use abbreviations. Um, and then you can use um, keywords and the running title which reflects uh, back to the main title. So here, for example, is the, the original title of a paper that we were generating. This is the SIEGE clinical trial uh, in pancreatic cancer, where we were looking at the scheduling of nabpaclitaxel combined with gemcitabine. 
In fact, when we actually got that to, to the manuscript to be published, we dropped the, the, the final bit of that sentence. We didn't think it was necessary in the title. We discussed the siege trial specifically in the methods section of the paper. So we kept the title simply to what we were actually testing. And then from that, we were able to generate the, the keywords. We were talking about scheduling of the intervention, now paclitaxel and gemcitabine in a particular disease area, pancreatic cancer. And the running title was shortened to scheduling now paclitaxel and gemcitabine. So that's an example of how you can just sort of break down from one to the other to the other with each of them connecting. Um, and you know, what we were then wanting to do is to help people search to find this kind of information um, in the multi multitude of, of, of publications and manuscripts out there. So after your title comes the abstract. And the abstract, again, is a really important part of your manuscript. It needs to be able to stand alone. It is essentially a brief summary of the full paper. It may be structured um, and along um, the, the IMRAD um, uh, outlines, or it may just be um, a paragraph. It usually has limited characters and words. But it's really important because it's the first thing that the editor is going to see once you've submitted it. And it's the first thing the reviewers are going to see when they're asked to review your paper. So it needs to be attractive and interesting and really summarize the key findings effectively. And of course, if you're a reader, the main things that you pick up on when you start reading is you look at the manuscript title and then you read the abstract and it's got to really catch you in order for you then to want to go on and read the rest of that manuscript. So still, we're not done. We still have more things to think about in this publication. We're very nearly there, but still a few more things to, to add uh, before you can submit. Don't forget authorship, nightmare. We're gonna talk a bit about authorship. Acknowledgements um, is more straightforward. Conflicts of interest. Um, most uh, journals will, will actually give you um, guidance on, on what they want to see uh, in the way of conflicts of interest. And obviously references, try and keep your references to the, 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 the key uh, publications that are, are relevant. Some journals will actually limit the number of references. You don't have to um, cite anything and everything that's ever been published in a field. Um, and think about what you would normally go to um, and where you would normally find your information rather than just sort of finding obscure uh, publications that nobody can get hold of. Other journals may ask for specific things. They may ask, may ask for a cover letter, which may again need you to think about what it is that um, justifies you um, or justifies the journal publishing your study. Consult diagrams are, are popular and what this study adds. So you may need to again think about um, some little bite-sized bits of, of information that, that will summarize um, uh, what your study is all about. So a bit on authorship, um, think about who are your co-authors and try to be inclusive um, and fair and order them with due care and attention. Um, when you know who they are, um, share your manuscript with them in plenty of time so that they do have time to review it and comment on the draft. So not just before you're literally about to submit. Um, and Think about what their comments are and revise and respect their comments and revise accordingly. So authors, who are they? They're all the people who make a substantial contribution to the concept or design of the work or acquisition, analysis or interpretation of the data. They need to be involved in drafting the article or at least revising it critically for important intellectual content. They need to approve the version to be published. And in some circumstances, you will be asked to uh, provide written uh, approval from them all. And they need to agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work in ensuring that questions related to the accuracy or integrity of any part of the work are appropriately investigated and resolved. So they really need to be truly engaged in developing um, and overseeing and owning that manuscript. So the first author, if you've done all the work, is hopefully yourself. Um, and you are likely to be the one who's done the bulk of the writing of the manuscript. 
Um, if you have a supervisor, whether that's um, a clinical supervisor and you're working in the clinical arena or you're in the lab, um, then um, you know, your supervisor will want to put you first. But this does assume that you do actually complete the piece of work um, that they are working with you on. And it's not unreasonable for a supervisor to actually uh, fix a time period, particularly if a trainee is, is, is really um, taking their time and maybe even drifting off onto other projects um, and moving away from, from their area. Um, because work does need to be completed in a timely fashion before it can sometimes become obsolete. So they may actually put a time frame on you actually generating that first draft. And if you don't actually achieve that, it is not unreasonable for somebody else to be coming along and um, taking your place as first author. So be aware that it is a competitive field. Um, and if somebody else does start having to, to, to fill in the gaps that, that you've left behind, then things like joint authorship, uh, joint first authorship might be considered. Your co-authors, um, um, as we've mentioned, these are the people they need to have been to demonstrate that they have made a significant contribution to the article. They still need to have responsibility and accountability for the work. The sequence of authorship um, should be determined by their relative contributions. Um, and sometimes publishers may again have specific comments about who they consider are co-authors and who are not. Um, the last author is common practice to, for this to be the senior author, um, regardless of his or her contribution, and you may or may not like that idea, um, I think really that should be somebody who has contributed significantly, but there are politics that, that do play out in, um, in the labs and in the clinic. Um, the senior author, however, should still meet all the criteria. And if you're not happy that they haven't contributed, you can always challenge whether they should be senior author. Um, in bigger collaborations, there may be um, senior people who wish to, to take penultimate and even pre-penultimate pre position. Um, Corresponding author, there always needs to be a corresponding author. So this is somebody quite often the senior author who takes responsibility for the submission, for receiving comments back um, from the reviewers and leading on the, the resubmission alongside yourself. Um, so just, you know, these are things that need to get sorted out before you actually publish. So I was just going to take you through a little bit of my own personal experience of, um, of authorship um, when, I was, uh, when I was young. So um, I started out, I did a BSc, um, an intercalated BSc after my first couple of years of, of preclinical medicine in London. And then that turned into a PhD. And I was working um, at the time um, in, uh, in a lab at St. Thomas's Hospital that was developing um, platinum um, second generation anti-cancer drugs. Um, we had cisplatin, uh, but the new second generation drugs were, were evolving, such as carboplatin that the Marsden was developing. And we were working on this drug called CHIP. And um, what I was doing was I was looking in vitro at how the drug was working within the cell cycle. Um, and then we also had some very fancy um, analytical scanning electron microscopy equipment, and we wanted to try and identify where the platinum was going in the cells and what it was doing. And, and so basically learning about the mechanism of action of the drug. So at the end of my PhD, um, Prof Nyasa was head of the department, liked the in vitro work that um, I generated, and he and I wrote up the um, in vitro work um, in this publication. So that's, that was fine. Now, at the end of my PhD, I went off to Oxford to do my clinical medicine, but I had a whole load of data that still needed to be published. So I spent um, the next year or so uh, whilst doing my clinical medicine, writing up this paper, which was about the, the biochemistry of, the, um, of how um, glutathione and the thiols within the cells within, were interacting with platinum. And, um, and I was clearly working on my own to get this published. Um, and I sent it off to JNCI, which was quite a, a decent um, cancer journal and, and got it published. 
And about a year or so later, I bumped into a postdoc in the lab that I was working in, and, and she, very, she was very sweet, and she just sort of very kindly said that um, she wished she'd had a chance to uh, contribute to the paper. And the penny really dropped that here was I, you know, working okay on my own when I was publishing it, but actually this work was done by more than just me. And actually, I should have acknowledged a number of other people in that publication. So the postdoc who um, had guided me a lot with the experiments. Um, I had two PhD supervisors and one that was working in the, in the labs with me had actually left and gone to Manchester. Um, but I still think you know, she, she had um, helped develop the, the project in the first instance and head of department had been very supportive to me. So I spent a lot of time feeling very guilty about the fact that um, none of these people were named on this paper. So I had another section of the, the PhD that needed writing up the electronic microscopy work. And in this situation, I was far more um, uh, proactive in engaging with my colleagues who were involved in that piece of work and, and, and I shared authorship with them appropriately. So here we are 30 years later, about something like that, showing my age. Um, just recently, we published the SIEGE trial, uh, which is a pancreatic cancer trial combining nabpaclitaxel and gemcitabine. We're looking at the scheduling of this combination in, um, in the clinic. And you can see here that there are about 30 odd co-authors. Um, so you can see I'm trying to be as inclusive as I can. I've included the, the guys who led the preclinical work, which justified the clinical trial. So Dave Tooverson and, um, and Duncan Jodrell and all the people who had contributed in terms of patients uh, participating in this study uh, are here. But about um, a few months after this was published, I got a, a, an email of complaint um, from an individual who was a clinical trial coordinator on the study. And in amongst these um, authors, there are several people who are, were um, employed by the trials unit to conduct the clinical trial, and they're all identified here in red. And of course, over the course of a number of years, people come and go, um, and this one particular individual had come and gone, um, had simply you know, no longer been around and had been overlooked. Um, it is a really difficult one when it comes to, um, I think, people working in trials units. They are employed to conduct the work. And I do think it's an area that, that each trials unit does need to um, decide, at the, again, at the outset as, as to who does um, warrant um, being named as an author on a paper. And there are no hard and fast rules, basically. So just some tips. Do seek advice from your senior editorial mentor. Agree your author authorship arrangements at the early stages if you can. Um, if you've got a protocol, set out your authorship arrangements in that protocol from the outset, and it will save you so much pain later on. And if you're the uh, victim of a situation where you think you are, uh, you have been missed out um, and not recognized for your contributions, do take the opportunity to challenge. Um, and it may be a, a case of being overlooked. Um, be polite. Remember, life isn't always fair. You might not get um, the, the outcome that you would like. And just don't hold grudges. We've all been there. It's just not worth it. So here you are, you're really, really, really nearly there now. Um, when, during the course of, of that, um, developing this, this um, manuscript, do write it, do rewrite it, um, and keep abreast during that rewriting of any new data and publications that come on over time, um, particularly if you're working in, in a rapidly changing field. Um, and do make sure that you do incorporate comments and advice from co-authors, even if they challenge what you think is right, be prepared to be open-minded. Um, try and think about getting an independent uh, proofreading of your final draft. Um, consider their suggestions and criticisms. You don't have to accept them all. Um, but just bear in mind that their comments are useful to think about what the reviewers might, um, might say when they see it. 
So a few final general tips before you submit that paper, writing style, uh, try and be succinct with your style, keep your sentences simple, one idea per sentence, avoid flowery subjective words, what you think is interesting and what is clear and obvious may not be to another reader, try and avoid these kind of terms. Uh, be careful with your abbreviations, make sure um, that you do state them up front, it's uh, a common problem. Um, be careful with your grammar and the use of tenses. Uh, people do tend to move from past, present and future rather um, uh, freely, which is not helpful. Try not to repeat yourself. Make sure that you're writing to the appropriate readership of the journal. Um, so if you're writing to an international journal, try and avoid specific um, phrases and, and issues that are UK specific. If you're writing in a, in a general journal, remember that there will be people reading it who aren't oncology specialists. Respect your word count, um, limit your words, um, and you know, the, 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 the limiting the word count is there to help you focus on the, the key aspects of your study. And if you can't contain it within the word count, share it with other people, independent people who can come along and just take a big hopefully red pen and cross out a whole load of unnecessary um, text. Very, very important, do not plagiarize. Um, nowadays, they have very clever ways of being able to identify blocks of text that is being copied directly from other manuscripts. Just don't go there. So the final section, dealing with rejection. We've all been there, we will all get there, um, but don't be dismayed. Very few papers are accepted outright. Um, so we've just early on, we looked at the, the, the high impact journals. They reject over 90% of submitted papers. So, you know, don't, don't, don't give it, don't give up basically. It's always worth thinking how the reviewers are asked to score um, uh, their, their papers when, when they read them. And they usually have specific criteria and some of them are listed here. Um, does the paper contain sufficient new material? Is the topic within the scope of the journal? Is it presented concisely and well organized? Are the methods and experiments presented such that they can be replicated? Are the results presented adequately? Is the discussion relevant, concise and, concise and well documented? Are the conclusions supported by the data? Are the figures and tables adequate, well designed? Are there too many? So you need to just go through and, and ask these questions of your own paper. And if you're answering negatively to any of these things, then again, that, that's areas for you to work on and improve upon. So don't be discouraged. It is okay to be disappointed, even angry um, at, um, at a rejection, just sleep on it and, uh, and hang, out, hang in there and take a deep breath and then come back when you're fresh and ready and reread the advice that's been given. So usually the reviewers comments will actually be helpful. Um, they may talk about the strengths as well as the weaknesses, address the criticisms. Is there any new work that you need to do? Um, do you need to rethink what you're concluding? Was it the right journal after all to go to? Um, and when you're ready, revise it and resubmit. One point to, to, make, um, uh, to make with you is, is don't bother um, to fight with the reviewers or the editors. Um, your goal is not to win the argument with a reviewer. Your aim is to get your paper published. And very rarely will you be able to overturn a reviewer or editor decision. Just accept their comments, their advice, respond, and rework your paper. Um, and because actually most often that will improve its quality. Just a few other common problems to think about. Um, quite often um, a number of us who, who review papers, you can, can pick out these, these common threads that uh, um, are, 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 are there. They can be too wordy, too long. Text is difficult to follow. The journal is simply the wrong fit. Uh, the grammar, the spelling, the format is not well put together. The, comment, the content is not up to date. The conclusions don't fit the data. So again, really think about what is it that your data shows. 
um, emotionalism, you can get carried away uh, with your own data and your own story, but actually you don't have the evidence to support your statements. There will come a time when you will get that letter that comes back and says, I'm very glad to say that we're accepting your publication. And it's a, such a great feeling um, that it really does make the whole journey uh, well worth it. Um, and what you then want to do is just find that next topic in order to start the whole process all over again. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, and then I thought I would um, really hand over to you guys um, to take any questions. Thank you very much for that a very interesting talk. Um, we have a few questions. Um, we've got one from Anna. Uh, who's asking um, whether a co-first author is an accepted uh, thing right now and does it vary from journal to journal? Yeah, I think it's absolutely fine. I don't think I've ever seen any journal say um, that that's not an acceptable option. I think it's something that you as a as you know, between the two of you and your senior author need to agree that that is an appropriate uh, balance of, of, um, of recognition for the work done. But no, it, it, it's absolutely fine. Thank you. It's really interesting you talking about being on top of the world when you get your paper accepted. I remember my first first author paper <laughs> that was accepted. I was standing in a, a car park outside the cancer centre and couldn't like literally didn't know what to do with myself for about two minutes, having spent <laughs> quite a lot of time going backwards and forwards. So it is a, it's, it's well worth that, that perseverance, I think. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks, Pippa. And once once you've done it once, I think you know you 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 build it builds your confidence, and you know you can then do it again. But it it, it can be it's an amazing it, it, it's a huge amount of work that goes into it, um, but so well worth it. I think it's realizing that it's, as you said, it's very much part of the process, and actually, it's it's kind of part of the the skill and the game, if you like. That 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 is something you will have to go through, and and finding the best fit yeah. doesn't happen first time very often. Mm. Very true. So uh, I think we have enough time for one more question from Karen Pursehouse, uh, who's uh, asking um, uh, about the acceptance or enthusiasm for enthusiasm for preprints and open access publishing in the clinical world, uh, and that these have been normal in basic science publishing for a while, but only since COVID has it gained prominence. So how do you uh, think trainees can publish in this way, and do you think uh, the system uh, job applications, grants, etc., will start to look for this. Yeah. Uh, I think so. I, 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 you're right. I think um, the the clinical side of things has probably been slower to to move in this direction. Um, but I'm certainly seeing a lot more of these um, open access um, journal sites now. Um, and I think one that's been really popular for clinicians is Esmo Open. Um, and, you know, that's been very um, effective, I think. So I think there will be more of those. And certainly, you know, uh, uh, from the perspective of, of, of value and, and credibility, I think they will be equally acceptable. So, you know, go for it. I th you know, I think it's um, maybe my generation are more traditional in the journals that we, we you know, we've been used to, to focusing on. But now there's, there's such a, a wealth of, of different um, journals. I think it is about the good fit. And at that point that actually, you know, if it's a high quality um, manuscript, um, you know, you've got something really good to say, or you've done something really high quality, um, the impact factor of the journal is less important. Um, so, you know, I think um, just go with where you think it fits properly. Thank you. I think it's been just interesting as a result of COVID, I think things like ESMA Open or Med Archive have really changed the idea and obviously for clinicians especially if you're not on an academic track you actually don't have funding necessarily to go open access so it feels like a really nice option to get your data out there in yeah. a fightable and, way and I, and I think there is a responsibility there for um the, the senior authors to be supporting uh juniors um to make funding available for these things um and certainly uh, so I saw um, the comment um, from Dr. Malik about um, how do you find your mentor and your trust? Well, I, you know, I think all, all consultants, um, you know, are potential mentors. Um, and, you know, we are all there. You know, we have been 
taught and you know and mentored over the years and we should be doing the same for all our junior doctors um, so I think you should feel free to approach any consultant any time if you feel that you've got a project that you think they can help you with um, and certainly most of us have access to some amount of funding um, in one way shape or form so most trusts will have some form of, of um, charitable funds or something like this um, that we should be using to support trainees to to publish to you know as in the past you know go to conferences and this sort of thing and present their work um, so it's part and parcel of you know the education and training of the next generation um, so, you know, it, it should be there um, if you ask for it. And if you ask, don't ask, you don't get. So, you know, I would never feel um, that you should, you know, should, should hold back. Um, but certainly if, if you think there's a journal that suits you and there is a cost that comes with it, you know, just, just be honest with them and work out a, a suitable solution. Thank you very much for that. Um, I believe that we'll be ending our breakout session very soon. Uh, so thank you for that talk. Okay, my pleasure. Right, so we'll all start to be rejoining the main.